All right. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm going to be starting in just a couple minutes, but of course, this is live. So I do intend to craft it based off of what you guys are saying, what questions you have, what things you want me to dive into more, and all of those good things. So what I will say before I even get started, all of this code, of course, is going to be on GitHub. So definitely check out the code if you're interested in diving into the code right now. Uh, this would be a good time to do so, so that you can get maybe some of the questions you might have. Of course, I'll mention this again shortly. Uh, but just generally speaking, I'm going to be doing a little demo of this new course that I created. Um, it's fairly comprehensive as far as the course is concerned. And I'm really, really interested in getting your feedback before I do my actual uh, demo that I do for the actual course. So the course isn't fully released yet, but it's it's really, really close. Um, but anyways, so I'm going to say hi to a few of you guys. Hey, what's up, Clinton? Code with Clinton. Hello, hello. Where is everyone from? Good to see you all here. Um, is this free? This course is not free. This course, the code is free. All of the code is free. Absolutely. Um, but the course itself is not free at this time. Um, it is available on my website and it will be available very soon in other places uh, once it actually goes live for sale. Thanks for the question. Uh, but hopefully the amount of work that I put into this is well worth the investment to you. And that's part of the reason I'm doing a demo is so you know about it. And of course, you could always uh, dive into the code, depending on your background and just learn from that. That's how I learned a lot of things, right? So I recommend that as well. Michael from Colorado. Nice. We're in Colorado. Uh, beautiful state. Absolutely. Um, I, I definitely need to go back and visit soon. Um, so, yeah. W I mean, I think Boulder, Colorado is one of the like coolest places uh, in the U.S. Um, as far as like how beautiful it is and also the surrounding areas. Uh, but I haven't spent enough time there to, to say for sure, like all of the things that one could say uh, about Boulder, Colorado in general. Um, cool. Lagos, that's right. Clinton, I should remember that. Uh, but thank you. Denver. I like Denver too. Denver's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So... Let's see here. Okay, cool. It's 1045. I didn't schedule anything major. I just wanted to do a quick little walkthrough of everything that I've been working on with this machine learning and Django course. Um, that's really the point to me is like, how do you actually practically put these things together? And that's what we're going to be talking about now. So even if you don't take the course, hopefully you'll get a lot from this demo so you can have an approach on how you might end up solving a lot of these challenges that come up. So first off, of course, I want to know and make sure that everyone's good with this size. I think it looks pretty good on my end. Um, maybe it's a little too big. I would actually rather it be a little too big than a little too small. Um, but this, of course, is the recommender. Now, the front end, the design of it is bare bones as usual because it's in Bootstrap. Um, but it does have a lot of dynamic features that we'll get into in just a moment. As I mentioned just a minute ago too, all of this code is available on my GitHub. So if you're not already aware, cfe.sh slash GitHub, and then just look for the actual uh, recommender um, you know, repo itself in there. Uh, feel free to fork and star it. If you fork it, you get updates to it if you're not already aware of that or at least you're aware of these updates on your own GitHub repo, uh, which I think is actually pretty neat. Okay, um, so the other thing is, of course, I'm going to be using Django. No surprise there, probably. All of this is about Django uh, itself. It seems like we have no complaints as far as uh, the size of things right now, so that's good. I'll carry on. Next up, uh, we're going to be using Celery. So Celery itself is going to be our worker process that will do a lot of the machine learning for us. This is going to be done in batches, right? So the machine learning itself will be done in batches. Um, and, and the big reason for that is because there's, a sh there's just so much data, right? Even what we've got here, there's not that many showing up, uh, but there are just a ton of movies in this 
uh, database. And so with a ton of movies comes a ton of ratings and therefore our data set will start to get really, really big. The other aspect of using Celery is that we can start to batch the training as well. So not just doing the batch inference or batch predictions, but we can also batch the training and use third-party training if we need to. Um, so doing machine learning, uh, it, it, it's multiple steps, right? So we could absolutely use deep learning. Deep learning is something that we do talk about in the course, definitely towards the end. Uh, but the idea being that you have to actually use a GPU and more robust systems than um, you know, the standard web application is used to. So having Celery will allow you to integrate with third parties to do such a thing. And I definitely talk about all sorts of things that are related to Celery and this particular series. So if you've never done Celery before, this will be um, a nice introduction to that. Um, and of course, if you have done Celery before, this will just kind of build on top of things that you may have already known. Surprise is the machine learning package we'll actually end up using. And it's made specifically for recommender systems. So it actually makes this really, really dead simple and easy. Even to just playing around with some of the surprise stuff yourself is going to be uh, really, really valuable in, in terms of adding it into your Django project too, which I like, I, I'm just like dumbfounded by how easy it is to make recommend, recommendation systems these days uh, using a concept called collaborative filtering, which I'll talk about in a moment. I will touch on Keras as well in the series. I'm not going to talk about it right now. Keras is a deep learning library. This just brings your machine learning like to a whole nother level. Uh, but in, in, in the case of this project, there, there are a number of things that we can absolutely talk about that make you know doing deep learning not necessary early on for a recommendation engine. Uh, but machine learning, absolutely. And again, maybe not even machine learning. I'll talk about that too. Now, the data set I'll be using is a very popular one, specifically the movies data set on Kaggle, but this is from the movie lens data set itself, right? So what we have to do with this is we have to download this data. We have to load it into Django. Then we end up making a bunch of fake data and doing all sorts of cool things there. We also have to clean up the data. I mean, because using public data sets is not always straightforward. It's not always easy to do. Uh, so that's also another aspect of this. And then finally, I'm going to be using HTMX. So if you've never used HTMX, this allows you to not be stuck on using so much JavaScript time and time again. So let's take a look at the first part of that. It's just HTMX itself, right? Hopefully, hopefully this alone is well worth the course. Now, if you go in here into movies, for example, and you want to re-rate them, right? So to do this, I'm going to go ahead and do popular. So immediately it happens. Now with specifically Django and JavaScript, you can absolutely make these things happen, but using HTMX makes it so much easier. And then this rating mechanism, so I can give it a five-star rating, it will save it. I can refresh in here, it's still there, right? So I reloaded the page, even though it's hard to tell, definitely reloaded the page. Um, but this, this actually sorting mechanism, I think is like one of my favorite parts of this whole series. Of course, the machine learning part is great too, uh, but being able to sort things in a specific manner using HTMX is just like so fun, right? So like, I don't know, uh, but then also doing the rating system itself also driven through HTMX. And this simplifies so much of the features that you want in a dynamic system in terms of rating. So if you think about like a recommender in general, what is the goal here? The goal is to recommend, automatically recommend great movies or great products or great something to the user, right? So that's the actual goal. So, so it doesn't really matter so much if it's like through machine learning or it's through statistics um, that are just kind of standard, fairly easy statistics. So what I mean by that is just highly rated movies, these ones might be the ones that you might want to recommend. And as far as a recommendation engine is concerned, that's okay. We could totally do that. Um, and it's not actually that hard to do. Uh, but anyways, let's go ahead and take a look at the, you know, th this actual top rated thing here for just a moment. So first off, here's all the code, not a whole lot to it. And if we go into our movies view, we've got this movie popular view, right? So that's not actually the one we want. We want the movie list view in here. So here's our movie list view. And we get, this is, of course, a class-based view, but you can do the same thing inside of a, um, whether it's a class-based view or a function-based view, 
100%. It's roughly the same thing. I'll, I'll, I, I mean, I could talk about that all day long. If you guys have questions on that, please leave them towards the end. But I'm happy to chat about them. But here's the idea, right? So we've got this query set here. And what this is doing here is it's actually looking for a new query set and it's passing in get parameters. This is literally all I have to do to actually resource the data. I'm looking in the URL itself based off of some sort of sort. And if we did this, let's go ahead and just come in here and do sort equals to popular. Notice that that changes and so does the sorting, right? So that's all I'm doing here is actually changing that URL. All of that is driven through HTMX. From there, again, with HTMX and Django HTMX, I can actually rechange the Django template that's coming through. There's no jQuery. I don't have to write extra JavaScript. I mean, this part is so cool and it makes it really easy to start building these kinds of engines and, and sorting them in some sort of fashion. Uh, now, another aspect that I go into is how to sort things by popular. And so if we go into our models, what we see is a way to calculate uh, popular ratings and whatnot. So calculating an actual score using like database features that is creating a sum based off of two other fields. Um, and, and all this is done through using signals and, and all sorts of like things that are pretty standard to Django. So if I've already, if I already like lost you as far as Django is concerned in terms of doing the analysis here, this is something I go into in depth in this series, right? So the point of me even talking about it at this point, you might be like, oh, I want to see the machine learning stuff. The point of talking about it at this point is the goal of the, the, you know, the website is to give you recommendations and doing popular calculations is a form of recommendations. It might not be a very good form of recommendations, but it is a form of recommendations, which I think is still very, very important and probably something you might do early on. Because the thing with machine learning, there's this concept called cold start, right? So um, a cold start means that you have no user data whatsoever. And so that you, the lack of having user data means that you're going to need to get that user data in some way. And so by being able to structure your Django project with what Django does well, will help you start to solve that cold start problem when it comes to the data itself. And that's, uh, that's definitely a key and a big challenge when it comes to starting a recommendation engine project whatsoever is that you just don't have a ton of data. You know what I mean? Um, so anyways, we calculate this data and with that, I'm able to change the query set based off of those calculations that we do on the entire query set, all the data that's stored in the database. And we can also see how to resort data. We do all, all sorts of stuff for preparing and complete, uh, cleaning data for machine learning and all that, uh, which I think is also pretty cool. So the movie model itself, this is actually corresponding almost identically to uh, what's in the data set, the data set that we grab from Kaggle, right? So it's almost all from that specifically. And then we just change the fields a little bit. And then we have utility features and functions to actually load in some of this data, right? So if we go into CFE home and utils, we see we can, we can load in the movie data set from a CSV file using built-in Python tools for CSV files. And it's actually pretty straightforward. So this is another thing where if you've never actually loaded from a CSV file into a Django model, this is what we'll do. We actually do that exact thing. Um, so it's actually pretty useful to be able to do that specifically to be able to load in from a CSV file that may or may not map perfectly to a Django model. Um, and again, with machine learning, we end up using a lot of data. We end up using a lot of third-party data sets. So being able to load that data into our database, which whether or not it's a Postgres database, a MySQL database, or some sort of supported database from Django, I mean, it's important to be able to see how all of those things end up working. Of course, we do that. Um, and so the other part of this is actually the ratings themselves, and more specifically, the ratings tasks. Um, so one of the things that I really wanted to be able to do was update my ratings all across the board, right? So again, this is not quite machine learning, but it is important for doing the recommendations is updating all of the ratings across the board for any given users. And what you'll see here is content type and this rating model. So looking at the rating model, 
Uh, one of the things that might make you a little uneasy about this course, but will definitely help you in the long run, is how we actually associate ratings to everything else in our project. The ratings themselves can be on any kind of model, right? So um, as it stands right now, it's on you know just a movie model, but this little rating box right here, we can reuse on any kind of model because I'm using generic foreign keys. And that's what's going on here, right? So we use generic foreign keys, which actually make it harder to calculate aggregate ratings. So with that calculation, that means that I have to actually have a task to do so. So on a regular basis, my celery task will update all of these ratings. Again, if we think in terms of scale, right? Like we're trying to get millions of users here. We're not gonna be calculating the ratings every time somebody rates something, but rather we'll do it in a batch, maybe at the end of the day or maybe every few hours, then we'll actually do the aggregate calculations for these ratings, right? And that's really important. And, and luckily we have a data set that we're working with that already leans towards that scale. Of course, if you're using a, a much smaller scale, you're not necessarily gonna have to do it um, like on celery or with a worker process, but you'll still need to sort of batch it, I, I would argue. Um, so yeah. <laughs> this is uh, this is definitely something that I think um, is really, really important when it comes to doing the ratings and doing it in a clean way um, to have both a, you know, a um, flexible, a flexible model for doing the ratings, flexible in terms of what it's rating. And then also it's directly uh, correlated to a specific user, um, which I think is also really cool. So if you haven't done generic foreign keys, if you haven't done any of those things, this course goes into that as well because we have to build up every little piece of this to make sense of what's going on. Um, and then uh, let's see. So after we did, after we do the ratings, what we do is we need to actually take a look inside of the data itself, right? So if we look in here, we've got a bunch of different Jupyter notebooks. Now, once we start moving towards machine learning, we need to use Jupyter notebooks very often, right? So it's, it's really, really common to use Jupyter notebooks inside of machine learning projects. Now for us, we need to use them also with our Django project, or it makes it a lot easier to use them with our Django project so we can rapidly iterate on all sorts of things here, right? So I'm actually able to grab the data set. I'm able to see what all the ratings are, which ones are missing, which movie IDs are missing, uh, which links are missing, all sorts of things related to my Django project, uh, notice that there are so many ratings. So this actually does take a good amount of time for this to run uh, because if you have 100,000 ratings or a million ratings, actually doing this query set does take some time. But what this allows me to do is actually rapidly iterate on the various functions and features that I might need to do to prepare for the machine learning aspect of it. And of course, this also means that we get into eventually the actual machine learning portion, which would be using Surprise ML with all of these different data sets, with all of the different things related to Celery. Um, and of course, like grabbing our models, doing some validation, doing some cleaning up, um, grabbing all the ratings that we ended up doing, and then actually training one. So initially with Surprise ML, we actually use none of our data, but actually the data from the movie's data set. Um, and then we actually go ahead and create our first model. From that, we then actually implement it into Celery itself. Uh, with all of our different training parts, um, the actual tasks themselves uh, will end up happening with our machine learning model here. So if we look at our tasks, we see that we can do this batch prediction. So we get our model. Uh, this again is explained very clearly, <laughs> hopefully very clearly inside of the course itself. Then we get a suggestion model, which is identical to the rating model, but this is now just for suggestions for the user. Uh, which corresponds uh, to the actual uh, homepage, right? So on this homepage, these are suggestions that, as you notice, they don't have any ratings in here. Um, and it's giving predictions or suggestions for this end up, this user, what they'll end up doing and whatnot. Um, so it's pretty cool. So once we actually can do all of the machine learning itself, um, then we can, you know, give individual users their predictions, add these to the suggestions, and then, do it in a uh, a batch that that ends up doing it over and over and over again. Um, so yeah, I mean that's kind of the gist of the course. Uh, I have I'm here to answer questions. Um, there, I mean I think I think there's a lot of things that we could go into as far as like the features and functionality, 
right? So like at the very beginning of the course, what we end up doing is, is creating a bunch of random ratings just to see how that's done. And, and we do this in order, like uh, using celery as well to, to see how celery is done. Um, and then we create a bunch of random users as well. And then eventually we modify that. So it's all um, realistically based um, and also based off of all these movies and stuff like that. So yeah, um, I'll, I'll start answering some questions. Happy to jump into any piece of this uh, as far as the code is concerned. Um, is it beginner friendly? Uh, this is the first question. Uh, so there's a great question. So I would say if you know how to use Django, if you know how to use Django and, and you've done maybe like my try Django series, even, even part of it where you can build models, you can, you can do views, you can do a list based view, you can do a detailed view, then yes, absolutely. This is comprehensive from understanding those things. Um, I do recommend that maybe you have some, maybe a little bit of experience using celery. Uh, it, it's not required for this, but uh, it would be a good idea to use some of that. Um, and yeah, I, like, I mean, I, I think, I think the thing is, is like, I try to make it as comprehensive as possible. So I go step by step to ensure that you get everything that you need to be successful with this series. Um, and of course, if it's, if it's uh, missing something, let me know. I want to, I want to make, continue to craft it on, on, um, on what you guys are asking for, what you really need in terms of building a project out like this. And I mean, realistically, like, I mean, there's a lot of features that I just didn't cover right here, but uh, one of them being actually doing authentication. That's, that's part of it. Right. So like it's, it's a full on project, like everything that you see here, we cover. Uh, so infinite review is a good one that, that really gets us into HTMX itself. Right. So I can literally keep reviewing, uh, you know, various movies on here, uh, and, and, or skip them. Right. So I can pick whatever rating I want. I've never heard of this one. So I'll give it a two. Right just because I've never heard of it. Like, it, like this is the thing about machine learning and collaborative filtering um, is, is like, you don't know why they're rating in a certain way. The only thing you know is what they've rated. So the machine learning part of this is taking what they've rated and the users that have rated it and then comparing it against other users to start giving you predictions uh, based off of arbitrary features of these, these like movies and, and the things that people are rating. Um, so that kind of takes your question a little bit further, uh, probably than you expected, but yeah, Josh, thanks for coming out. I'm glad you're here. I'm going to try and do more lives. I promise you that. Um, I just need to get in a regular like cadence with it. And I think like doing live demos, you know, sometimes it's good. Sometimes it's not. We'll see. We'll see what you guys think about this one and what feedback that I get from you on this one uh, as well. And, and, and honestly, I finished most of the recording for this series already. Um, and I did that a little over a week ago. And so like some of the concepts and stuff aren't necessarily fresh in my mind, but that was done on purpose so that we could talk about it and it, and like, you know, all of the different things that we might want uh, as far as this demo is concerned, we can do. Um, what's the best way to use React and Django? Uh, so this, is, of course, is not exactly relevant to this demo, but I'm happy to answer any questions itself. Uh, that's why I'm here. I'm here to answer questions. So whether or not you're asking them about the demo or not, that's cool. Um, so the best way to use React with Django is probably through the Django REST framework. Uh, so the Django REST framework building up your API. Now, part I mean, part of the reason too that I love this question right now is because HTMX makes this like unbelievably simple. You don't have to use React then. You can just use Django templates in the Django templating engine so that you can get really strong in that area, which is something I'd recommend you do prior to really diving into using React or any other sort of JavaScript front end. Uh, that's that's my opinion. Uh, what's the best between these two, Django or Vue.js? Or, well, the question you're asking is what's better, React or Vue? Um, because Django's a, Django using React or Vue uh, doesn't really matter, right? So the Django side can use either one of those just just fine. Now, personally, I like React JS a lot, uh, but Vue has a lot of popularity too. So I think they're both really good, um, and it's really just about picking one and getting good at it. So then you can switch to the other one. Uh, so yeah, you're studying AI. Is this a good course to follow? I think so. Yes, because um, the thing about whenever you are trying to get into machine learning or deep learning, anything that's data heavy. 
there's a really good chance you're going to need some sort of backend in general, some sort of web-based component if you really want to see how to practically put it in to action, right? Because just creating a model is only one piece of it. And I barely even talked about it, right? It's only one piece of it to actually provide value to users or to a business. And so the, the important thing here is to learn how to provide value and what context your work as an AI developer will be, right? And in some cases, it's going to be specifically about, um, you know, writing a model and, and refining the model and then getting it into production in some sense, right? And so what we do in this course, I think will help you understand uh, like so many facets that go into actually um, having an AI model in production and how it actually could be useful. Try Jerry Django series is cool. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you enjoy it. Um, it is not going to be a uh, YouTube course. It's going to, it's actually already available on my website. Um, the point of this right now is to get some feedback from you guys, some questions. Um, if there's any like missing pieces as to what I just showed you, uh, all of that, or, or just to answer questions in general, but, but really I, I'm most likely going to have it on my website and on Amazon courses. But, uh, you know, at this point, um, those are really going to be the only two places that it'll live. Maybe at some point it'll make its way on YouTube, but there's no plans for it right now. Hey, Pravnar or Pravar. Good to see you. Great to have you back. Um, let's see. Can we use HTMX in place of React Native? No. So React Native is for mobile devices. React Native actually compiles into a mobile device. And um, in order for a mobile device application to work with something like Django, more than likely you'll need to create a REST API itself. But it can be used in place of any sort of web you know, front-end framework that you might use, whether it's React or Vue or any other sort of JavaScript framework that's there. Uh, can HTMX work with the Django REST framework? They actually, of course they can. HTMX can use JavaScript, work with JavaScript as well. So you can ha absolutely have a React front-end and still use HTMX. Um, I do that on my website right now. Now, the Django REST framework itself is just a way to serialize data, right? It, it's a way so you can make a REST API. HTMX doesn't need to call a REST API at all, but it still can. Um, it just wouldn't need to, right? Because HTMX is delivering HTML, right? So it's going to deliver HTML that's going to replace an element of some kind where REST, um, the Django REST framework or any REST API typically returns JSON, right? JavaScript object notation. That's what REST APIs often have. Um, and this is true for other kinds of APIs as well. So like GraphQL often returns some sort of, you know, uh, JSON data as well. So what HTMX does is it allows you to return just HTML. But the thing is, when you use it with Django, you can enrich that HTML based off of any normal Django context, uh, which is like fantastic. I mean, that alone to me is like worth this entire series, uh, just knowing how to use HTMX because it can save you so much time to build uh, dynamic features on your site. So I actually want to dive into this a little bit more. So um, if we look at if we look at um, this pick rating right here, right? So we come in here and we pick rating. Now, if you're using jQuery, you would, or jQuery, React, whatever. Uh, let's say it's React, okay? So React would render this entire element. Then it would have to get somewhere through an API or some, some other way. It would have to actually get the value that, that you have for that rated element. Actually, let's go to go here. So million dollar hotel, right? So if I change this value, let's take a look at the detail of it. Every time I refresh this page, React.js would have to fetch my current rating for this, right? How I have it working is it's actually based in, in the Django session. So it's a little bit more efficient as far as how it's storing that. But that alone, getting, getting the previous rating for this user in React.js takes a lot of development to make that happen. Maybe you have to use something like Redux to efficiently look for that value. And then you have to enrich this, this form itself, right? Now, the other thing is the actual choices themselves, right? So these dropdown choices, where does that come from? Now, in the Django project, in the Django only project, I'll show you exactly where that comes from. And we go into our ratings, we go into models. It comes from this right here. 
So if I do a quick search for this rating choices, what you'll see is I've got a context processor here. This context processor enriches rating choices to be available on literally any template. So if I go into base.html and just do rating choices, just like that, save it and refresh in here, there are my rating choices. Right? So I can literally use this anywhere I want. Again, with React.js, you know, you can do something similar to this, but it's not based in something that also is directly tied to the database. So this rating choices here is directly tied to a dropdown for the rating model. Again, with React.js, it's not necessarily going to do that without many, many steps to make that happen. Now, that's just a context variable. So you're like, okay, it's just a context variable. Can't I just pass it in to React some way? Yes, you can. But the thing is, this context variable I can use inside of HTMX. So let's say, for instance, the movie card right here, right? So the snippet here, we've got this card. And what we've got, if I remember correctly, oh, no, the rating snippet is actually here. So let me just go back. I'll, I'll keep this one open and I'll go into the rating snippet. So here are my rating choices and here's what's being iterated. This form, this one single form is the one that you see everywhere, literally everywhere. Every time you see that on this page is this one right here. And this is rendered in two ways. One, directly with Django, like you see here, right? So that's how it's being rendered in Django. And another way is with HTMX. And so with HTMX, that's something like this, this little snippet right here. That little snippet is going to render an HTML template. Specifically, let's go ahead and actually go into the detail one. Hang on, let's see here, the detail view. So we've got movies detail, okay? And so, yeah, that's not going to show us it. Uh, but anyways, the point is that this little snippet here is through HTMX and it renders out all of the different card elements, which, which also render out these rating choices. Um, all of this stuff is, is just like so simple to do with HTMX. So hopefully that answers your question. Um, I, I, like I, I, <laughs> I mean, I should have called this HTMX course, but there is a lot of machine learning in it too. Uh, but it sounds like you guys are, are a lot kind of interested in the HTMX stuff. So uh, maybe because I started it that way and it's just like so excited about how HTMX is from a developer standpoint. Um, you want to learn coding, which language should you start with? Yeah, I really think Python is one of the best ways to start uh, because you can build all sorts of things, including like what I'm talking about here, which is really Django heavy. Uh, what are the steps to implement a e-commerce like cart? Okay, y yeah, so um, I have an entire e-commerce course that is still relevant to this day. Um, and then also I think even the Django bootcamp that I did in 2020 also talks about products and courses and uh, products and whatnot as well. Um, but the actual feature and functionality of it uh, is actually not a whole lot different than what I did here, right? So instead of it being a rating here, you would say add to cart and Django HTMX can do that. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of different features that we can end up going with something like that. Perhaps I need a new e-commerce series itself at some point. Um, so yeah, good. Thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Uh, let's see here. Every course is fully loaded with tons of information. Thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate it. Yeah, I think I think this this is my like most modern take on building a Django project in general. It just so happens that part of that means that we use machine learning in the whole ecosystem of Django itself, but not right away. We build towards it. <laughs> that's the that's another aspect of this. Um, now that Django can integrate async features, can you make a course to show them? Okay, so um, personally, I think if you're going to do asynchronous features that have that are worth any salt, like if they're worth something, you're likely going to like delay it to a worker process, no matter what. So what I mean by this is, technically speaking, you could have a request with modern versions of Django that are a lot longer that can actually you know create a report of something, right? Well, longer is relative because G Unicorn might time out, Nginx might time out. So let's let's just let's just assume that you could do this this long async request, okay? Um, and so if you have a long async request in Django, that means that you probably should have it using something different, and that of course that different thing is Celery, right? So using Celery is the way to go. 
I, I will always say that because it's a worker process. You can delay running something that you would need maybe asynchronously to celery. Now, are there times where it could maybe speed up how fast a query set loads in a list view? Yes, but even with that, you could use caching and all sorts of other things um, that make the async functioning functionality not necessary, not as necessary as as many many other tools. Um, and I still have yet to see a really really strong reason to use async functions for views um, in in pretty much any you know web application framework. Um, you know, perhaps there's some efficiency gained in the the query itself to the database. But again, if you're using caching correctly, um, you, you won't necessarily have a ton of efficiency there. And the efficiency is, is, is microseconds. It's not it's not going to be a, a drastic change for anyone. Um, but but the complication and in, in, in putting it together, I think, is is there. Uh, but it sounds cool. I, I don't know. Perhaps I'm wrong. I would love to. I would love to see more data in that area to see if I'm wrong or not. Can Django run equally good with mobile devices? I, I mean, really, really, um, yes. So Django doesn't run on the device though. Django would be a server-side framework in this case, and it's really gonna be the basis for a server-side REST API. It would not run in your mobile device. It would run on a server. Hopefully that answers that question. Uh, GraphQL with Django. Yeah, so GraphQL is interesting. Uh, like something I don't love about it is that it's like a little too flexible and to, to, to bring it down to like not as flexible takes like just a lot of configuration where it's like, well, why don't we just declare what we want in our APIs up front? And that's why I, I tend to use REST APIs. Um, but I, I appreciate the suggestion. Uh, the course, you can already start the course now, right? So you can already go ahead and, and take a look at it. Um, I realize this comment is... Maybe um, maybe geared towards, am I going to do the course right now? Well, no. Okay, so who's this course for? So anyone who's interested in getting machine learning working on a Django project, this is the course for you, right? So if you've never done that before, I definitely recommend that you do this because we build up to actually having a machine learning model working. This is also true for anyone who's doing a lot of batch processing or needs to do a lot of batch processing. So if you're doing a lot of reports or you have to, you have to generate a lot of reports from data in your database, this is also a key component to this because we absolutely do export data sets, which could then be, you know, just a report of some kind or aggregation, aggregation of data as well. Um, so to me, this is like, Hey, if you've done some beginner Django stuff and you've feel really confident in doing models and views and tests and all that, you're ready for this course. This, I think, is is the course right after doing a lot of that beginner stuff. Um, or if you're just interested in Django HTMX, you could do the first half of this course. <laughs> so that helps. Hey, what's up? Hey, from Nigeria, what's up? HTMX enabled shopping system. Also, if ML can be used in it, yeah, that would be that would be a, like an amazing, massive, massive course. Um, so, like building the e-commerce stuff from the get-go using HTMX, I think that is like low-hanging fruit from a course in general. Um, I don't have bandwidth to do it just yet, but I hope to do it in the near future. Um, and then, then building machine learning on top of that, I think I think it would actually have to be its own course. The machine learning part of it would have to be its own course, but using what I have here will eventually be able to help you marry the two. Um, and that's really kind of the point. How about Django and NoSQL? Um, so you wouldn't use Firebase with Django, most likely. I mean, there's probably integrations. There's probably ways to do it. Uh, but Django itself is made for SQL databases, for SQL databases. Um, so if you're using NoSQL like Mongo or Cassandra, you definitely can use those databases with Django. It's just they're just not as effective, right? That's not what Django is designed for. So if you're like, oh, I want to use MongoDB or Cassandra, I would say use FastAPI. Uh, unless, of course, you need the built-in Django user management, in which case you still can use Django, uh, but maybe you use SQL just for user user management and then no SQL for everything else. Because I think Django does really, really well with the user management stuff. And I don't think that a lot of the user-related like authentication and sessions and all that, I don't think that needs to be in a NoSQL database myself. I would love to hear 
uh, somebody else's like who has experience doing those two things uh, opinion on that. Uh, but but really, you you probably aren't going to be using Django with NoSQL. How to customize Django filter template? Great question. Uh, it's not something I can do right now, but thanks for asking. Um, hey, I'm great. How are you? MRM, hello. Um, do you need to be an intermittent Django user to use this course? No, I think I think like somewhat of a beginner can do this. If you've done, if you did like more than half of my Try Django course, like basically any of them, um, you could probably do this because I go from the beginning. Like I, I might work a little bit faster than you might be comfortable with, um, but that's also true for you know if you are on the more advanced side you can still work through this and get a lot out of it as well. So I, I try to try to get both ends there. Um, how can you get started? Just go to cfe.sh and the course is on there. That's where it is. That's where I have it right now. Um, and at this point, it is not on Udemy. If there's a huge, huge demand to have it on Udemy, absolutely, I will consider it. Um, I will probably be releasing it on Amazon courses here in the near future as well. So check that out. How do you set the sites with using Django or Flask? This is CSS, Cascading Style Sheets. Check that out. <laughs> That's hilarious, Terry. Thank you. Um, can a Django project work on a free host? Yes. You could, you could, if you have a virtual machine of some kind, that's where I would go, right? So the thing is, if you go to... Um, Let's see if I have a banner for it. I don't know if I do. Let me just open up a web page real quick. And I will show you. Yep. So uh, there's a couple places where you can do this for free. Uh, let's see. Do and I will give you those links right now. Okay. So if we go... Linode, linode.com slash CFE. As you may know, I work a lot with the Linode. They are a fantastic sponsor of the things that I do. So I do recommend that you go here. I don't personally benefit directly from this webpage, um, but I do work with them a lot. So I just wanted to make that clear. And it's a hundred dollar credit that you'll get. So it's basically free to learn how to do these things on a virtual machine, which is what I recommend. You can also do this on DigitalOcean. Also with DigitalOcean, I work with them a lot. Um, they are a big sponsor as well. Uh, so do.co slash CFE-SH. This is another place that you can get some cr free credit. This one is, uh, you know, has a limited time span where the, the Linode one, I think is, uh, oh, 60 days. Yeah, so not not quite as long um, or not double. I'll have to talk to them about that. Uh, but the point is both of these places, you can deploy virtual machines. And with it, a virtual machine, you can absolutely learn how to run Django in production. That's what I recommend that you do. I have a full series on it called, um, I, I, I'm trying to remember back to what exactly it was, um, but the Django de uh, deployment pipeline on my website as well, uh, that will show you how to deploy Django uh, with a lot of these free sources too. Uh, so thanks for that question. Um, as far as like absolutely free, yeah, I, like as far as $0 a month, uh, they're, they're, they're becoming fewer and fewer out there, uh, but there are something called platform as a service, a pass that, that will allow you to do that. Um, cause, cause like, it's like kind of a, a, um, an easier way to do it than a virtual machine, but doing it with a virtual machine will give you so much foundational knowledge that that's the record. That's the way I recommend you go. You're James from Taipei. Hey James, thanks for coming out. Django with Postgres is the best match. I agree with you, especially if it's a managed Postgres database, so you don't have to think about it. Hey, Gilberto, what's up? Can we cu customize pandas.describe method? Uh, that's a good question. I, I'm i sure there's a way to customize it. I just haven't ever needed to. Um, what are you trying to do exactly? You're doing Django REST framework in this channel. It's the final point. Which projects are best to implement the Django REST framework? That would be some sort of JavaScript front end or a mobile application, right? So if you have a mobile application, you can use React Native, you can use Swift, you can use, um, what is it for Android? Java. You can use all of those to then consume the REST API, or you could build a whole nother Django project that uses that, that other project's REST API. 
um, that that would be a good good challenge given that you're doing the Django REST framework because APIs, specifically REST APIs, but all APIs are for software to software communication, right? It stands for application programming interface for a reason. So software can communicate with each other. Um, kind of like how you and I are communicating right now, software can communicate with each other and pass data around. So that's that's kind of my thoughts. Future Django, oh, Django is going to be around for a long time because backend technology will be around for a long time. And the evolution of backend technology will often be an abstraction on top of a database that's secure with users and all sorts of interesting and cool things. So I think we'll see Django for a long time. There's not that many things that even just do the built-in Django user authentication and sessions as well as Django does. Um, that's that's to say, I mean, if Kubernetes came out and started doing user management, maybe maybe like through a database, the, the, you know, we might see a whole another a whole another thing with with that in terms of uh, of Django and competition. But that kind of competition is actually really really good. Uh, so yeah, hopefully that helps. Thanks, James. Glad to hear it. I'm glad you enjoyed it. A Django app for push notifications like Firebase. Um, so like actually doing push notifications. Um, that is something Django integrates with a lot of different tools to do so. Um, and it depends on what kind of push notifications you're referring to here. If you're talking about a mobile push notification, you will tend to need an app for that. Uh, and that's outside the context of, of Django itself. Django can do that, but yeah. Docker and Django co courses in the future. Yes. So I actually already have a number of them. Um, and... I also have stuff on my website. Let's go over to that. Uh, let's see here and see if you.sh. Let's take a look together on my website as what courses are available for that. So if you do a quick search in here for just simply Docker, you'll see a number of courses that talk about this. Docker and Kubernetes, this course certainly covers Docker, or excuse me, Django and Kubernetes certainly covers Docker and Django, uh, but of course the Kubernetes way. The Django deployment pipeline, this absolutely covers Django on Docker with Docker Hub, which is something I highly, highly recommend that you do. Uh, so this goes into a lot, in, in, including putting uh, Django into production and using your first Docker file and all that. So highly recommend that you do this one. Um, I also think I have other ones for Django and Docker. Uh, let's see here. There's Docker and Docker Compose. This one, I absolutely go into even more stuff with Django and Docker, or maybe it's just Docker specific. If I, I, I can't remember specifically about it because Docker itself is really flexible. Um, but this will also show you how to like set up Nginx to run all kinds of services, not just a Django based one, but maybe um, a Node JS one or a Go one. This is one that does all of that, uh, which I think is pretty cool as well. So yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, Real-time project with Django and Celery, Django channels and Celery. Yeah, Django channels is not my favorite, but it, like, cause there's a lot of good tools to um, use over Django channels, but real-time chat is actually pretty cool. So at some point, maybe, maybe we'll calculate this. Oh yeah, so how to use some. So this is a good one because I actually do this in this one. Let's see, I did it on my ratings. Okay, so let's take a look at the sum itself. Okay, so sum right here. So this is a database function that we can do. And so what this is doing is it's taking the value of all of the rating average field. So the rating average field is right here, which is calculated elsewhere. It's also taking the value of the rating count field and it's multiplying those things together. And then with that the multiplication, it's then summing it up to a float field based off of every single value, right? So that is then going to give it a score. So that is literally every, you know, field or every, every row, every, every uh, instance of this movie can then be calculated in this way, which is great. So it's just a matter of trying it out. I definitely talk about it in the course itself, um, but it, it's like a database function. It's it's pretty pretty neat. Uh, thanks for the question. All right, so I'm only going to do a few more questions here. We've been on here for a good amount of time. Um, 
so yeah, I mean, of course, if you have just general questions, let me know. Um, stoked you guys are here hanging out, asking questions, how to do cron jobs in Django. Um, this is actually something you would use celery for. Let me pull that up. And this, of course, is covered in this course as well. Uh, so Django Celery, you can use cron-like services in here. You can absolutely set up cron as well. For those of you who are not familiar with cron, it's just a way to run things on a regular basis um, in a Linux server if it has cron installed and it's set up. Um, so I personally think using Celery is the way to go because there's a lot of other features that come in here. Granted, it does then rely on something like Redis or RabbitMQ to run, um, but those things are well worth it, um, in my opinion. But you can you can use cron to run any sort of function on your entire site or or on your entire application on the virtual machine itself. Uh, a Doku course, yeah, that sounds great. Really, really think that's a good idea because it's an open source version of Heroku that you can deploy anywhere. But really, this would be about deploying Doku somewhere, right, Josh? Um, which I think they have pretty good documentation, but but it's definitely something I'll I'll uh, I'll continue to consider um, because it's like you know it, it's it's pretty cool uh, uh, tool itself. You know, what do I recommend for RSS reader? Um, yeah, so Django could could actually be an RSS reader itself, uh, but I think there's a lot. I, I haven't I haven't tried to do freely. Uh, or making an RSS reader in a long time. Uh, thanks for the question, though. Uh, let's see here. How do I advise getting a remote Django job? Just create a lot of projects, put them on GitHub as a repo, and maybe write articles and stuff, too, uh, on, on what you learned through that process. And then when you find a job that's looking for something, like think through the problems that they might be having and, and provide solutions prior to even reaching out to try and get a job. But that's my recommendation. Fast API versus basically Django. Um, so it, it really depends on what you're trying to do. If you need users and user authentication, I work way faster with Django. Uh, if you need other things that are API related that don't necessarily need users in that service, Fast API is the way to go um, because you can, you can combine these things too through something like Nginx. And of course, Django REST framework would be my tool of choice. Um, because, well, I haven't used Django Ninja. <laughs> like, I, I think I toyed around with it a little bit, but I haven't really used it yet. I'm sure it's great. It's It's been getting some good feedback uh, as far as I've heard. Probably need to spend more time with it. Uh, what's the best message for packaging Django apps like you have? Oh, yeah. So uh, Docker. Docker is the best for everything. <laughs> so if you need to move things around, it's Docker. Um, otherwise, you're going to be using, and probably also in Docker, you'll use something called a virtual environment, but you don't package it up into a binary. Um, it, it just, it's just not necessary unless, of course, you're using Docker, in which case it's then a container. Um, so you don't package Django in the same way you would like a Java app. Uh, that's just not how it works. Uh, perhaps there's a way to do it with like Pi installer, but it's just often not necessary. Is it possible to, of course, advance Django with fine-grained permissions like an IAM system? Um, Yes, that's a great, great question and a great um, suggestion for a potential course. Ch take a look at Django Guardian. It's a pretty interesting way to handle permissions, uh, fine grain permissions on objects themselves. Uh, and of course, like Django permissions, built-in permissions are, are pretty good as far as groups are concerned as well. Um, I do not use Django and Wagtail at this point. I'd be more likely to use Hugo for my blog than pretty much anything else and then just have it hosted uh, through Nginx or something like that, uh, and then use Django otherwise. Is Django Q better than Celery for offloading tasks? Um, I haven't used Django Q enough to give it a proper comparison, uh, but Celery itself, I think, is a juggernaut and doesn't need Django. Um, so J Celery can run on its own. So the fact that it can, it means that you can use it with pretty much any other framework or Python project you might have. Django Q, I believe, is only for Django, which I think makes a little bit vulnerable as far as like learning is concerned. You want a, a worker process that can work in a lot of different places. Um, so yeah, the link of the course, I probably should have put that somewhere. 
It's on my website, so cfe.sh slash courses. Just look for the recommender. It's there. Uh, yeah, great suggestion and feedback. Um, I use Bose Quiet Comfort. Those are my headphones. Uh, yeah. So if you have any other questions, let me know. Uh, I see that there's a couple left, but I'm going to be wrapping this up in just a moment. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this demo. If you did, please let me know in the comments after this video publishes on YouTube. Uh, maybe throw a thumbs up. I think the thing about demos is like there's a lot of different ways on how I could go about demoing this course. Um, and so I just want to sort of also get feedback from you guys as to what you might be interested in as far as courses are concerned and all that. Um, so do appreciate all the questions and the comments and checking out the demo. Absolutely. Does anyone make a full fledged website using just the Django Rust framework? Yeah, I'm sure they do. Uh, but it's not ever just one technology piece, right? Like Django Rust framework has a lot of things that like are sort of assumed in it. Like you have a Django working project uh, and then to actually have a website, you need HTML somewhere and the Django Rust framework does not render HTML. Django does. <laughs> is it, um, is React necessary to use along Django? Now, I think, I think the thing is like React and Django or integrating Django with React or integrating Re React with some sort of backend is something you're going to need to learn how to do. And yeah, I think both of them are, are, are like a, a really nice complement to each other for what they do well, but they don't always need each other. It's kind of kind of the big thing here. Uh, now, to me, I think HTMX is a lot more compelling than React uh, for development time. Uh, you can go way, way, way so much faster. Now you can still use React for pieces of it, but you don't have to use React completely. Cool. So anyways, guys, uh, so... Uh, oh, I want to answer this one. Django.emv is not supported any, any longer. Python.emv works absolutely. Um, there's another one called Python decouple, which I really like. I think that's what I would end up using. Um, yeah. How often do you go to the gym? Not as much as I like to, but I'm trying to go at least two times a week. And then I play around with my kids a lot at their playgrounds and stuff like that. So that's sort of a workout. <laughs> Uh, but I, I, I mean, realistically, I would love to go maybe four or five times a week, um, specifically to the gym and I go to a climbing gym and I'm back at it. So yeah. How do you add in SSL? You would put in Nginx, uh, and then use let's encrypt or cert manager. That's what I would do. Hey, thank you. Thanks for the, thanks for the comment. Uh, do, would you recommend Node.js or Django for a service-based website? Both. You could use both. Um, no, I personally, they're not a, a fair comparison. What you're asking is, would you rather use Node.js or Python? That's a fair comparison. Uh, personally, I would rather use Python. I know Python really, really well. I know I know JavaScript really well, and I know Node.js really well. So the next question then would be, what framework would you recommend? And Django has the most built-in features and probably the biggest community for those built-in features. So I have to go with Django most of the time. James, you've got it. Okay, guys. Well, thanks for coming out. Appreciate it. Hope to see you at the next live stream. Um, let me know again if you want to see more demos of the things that I'm working on. Um, and also if we intend to, uh, you know, do a lot more of these kinds of demos. And maybe maybe the demo itself should be about one nitty -gitter gritty feature that that course really covers. Um, that way it's not just like this high level overview that doesn't really um, yield towards asking a ton of questions necessarily. Uh, so yeah, uh, thanks again for coming out and hope to see you guys next time. Take care. And ending.